this is a talk on the LLVM project tools. So how is this different? And this is a very dense topic. We'll be covering a lot of ground in the next 45 minutes or so. So let's get started. So uh, the goal of this talk is to basically introduce you to LLVM as a technology stack in itself. Basically, uh, since many of you might be having a web or app development background, LLVM is more analogous to something like the entire MERN stack or uh, say an entire web stack where you have a front end language, you have a back end language, you have a database, and uh, you have uh, various things that glue it together. So rather than just one piece of uh, technology or one compiler. So uh, very central to LLVM is uh, something known as the monorepo. Uh, what is a monorepo? Basically, a monorepo is any version controlled code repository that holds a lot of projects, which is a fancy way of saying that uh, you have 10 or 15 projects uh, that are loosely related to each other. But instead of storing them in uh, one repository, in multiple repositories, which is what you normally do if you have like, uh, let's say 10 web projects or 20 different other types of projects, you'd store them in uh, different repositories. But uh, in, instead over here, we store them in one repository. So these projects might be related, but they are often logically independent and they're run by different teams. So the LLVM monorepo is hosted on uh, GitHub. Uh, you can go explore it. And there are many sub projects that leverage each other's technologies and benefit from a common build system, code style, code uh, quality standards, and staying up to date with the trend. So what does this mean? Uh, basically, you can think of it as uh, these different uh, LLVM projects, while they are independent tools, LLDV can be used uh, independently of using Clang, right? You can use LLDB with the GCC compiler if you like, or you can use uh, uh, you can use the LLVM backend with another language's frontend. But even then, uh, these sub projects have certain dependencies. Uh, like let's say you have the CIRCT project which uses MLIR. So if there is a change in the code of MLIR, CIRCT will have to keep up with that change. Or if LLVM Clang is there, if there's a change in MLIR, again, it will have to keep up with those changes. Or the way LLDB uses the front end of uh, 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 Clang's uh, Lexer. So if something changes in uh, Clang's Lexer, then LLDB will have to be updated. So to avoid doing that, we keep all of the projects together in one repository so wow. that uh, they stay up to date with the trunk, which is where all the development is happening. So. Uh, the sub projects are initially incubated and they are graduated to the monorepo once they achieve community consensus. So you can see here, uh, like uh, basically the bold project uh, was something that was added to the monorepo very recently. And uh, there is an RFC to graduate uh, CIRCT to the monorepo right now. So uh, you can see here that there's a discussion that started sometime in November 2021 to prepare Bolt to be added to the monorepo. So basically Bolt was a tool that was uh, independently built by Facebook, but uh, uh, later on it was added to the LLV monorepo and now it lives there. So uh, there are some advantages, as I mentioned, you can maintain your code style, you can ma maintain quality standards, and you can maintain common build systems, like using one CMake command, you can build all of these different projects. But yes, there are some disadvantages also. One is that the LLVM repo is a la rather large uh, che git checkout, like it's a several gigabytes large file, and uh, there are a lot of commits to it every day. There are hundreds of commits on it every day, so keeping in touch with that could be difficult. And uh, of course, there is CI noise. If any one of these projects fail, your patch will not land, uh, depending on the policy. So having a decision to have a monorepo or an integrated repository, it's an opinionated, opinionated decision. It comes with some upsides and some downsides. It's something that's debated very hotly in the LLVM community, whether or not a project should be added to this. But uh, there are other monorepos in technology, like uh, Google stores all of its uh, source code in one large repository that's around uh, 80 terabytes or so. 
and uh, the Linux kernel is also a mono repo. So uh, that's the introduction to the mono repo. So now that we know what a mono repo is, how is the LLV mono repo set up? So you can see here at the top, we have uh, whatever is in the LLVM uh, project space. The main uh, repository in the LLVM project space is aptly named LLVM project. And there are many, many uh, uh, projects under LLVM project, which is your LLVM core, which include your Okta and LLC uh, tools and uh, frameworks. Then you have LLDB, which is the debugger. You have Clang and Clang. There are several tools under Clang, such as Clang ID, Clang format, Clang query, which we'll see later. There is the C++ standard library implementation called libc++. There is a runtime library known as compiler RT. There is MLIR. Uh, there is OpenMP. There's Poly. There's an OpenCL uh, implementation called libclc. There is uh, 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 there is also LLD, which is our uh, which is our uh, linker, and then there's Bolt. There are several incubated projects also. So these projects are not a part of the Mono repo yet, but uh, they hope to get there someday. And also they are also they live under the LLVM uh, uh, umbrella on GitHub. So these include Torch MLIR, CIR, CT, Polygis, etc. And your uh, other language front ends that use LLVM as a library, uh, like uh, they don't uh, live inside LLVM, they use LLVM as a library or they use LLVM to drive their compiler. These are located outside, so you can see support for Ruby, Python, Haskell, Rust, DPHP, Lua, Julia, and other languages, it's located outside. So we'll be covering all of this, what it does briefly. But first, uh, I will uh, hand over to Prerna to explain the LLVM core. Yeah, thank you. I, before that, we can actually have a, a recap of what we covered in the previous session. So the previous session was around what technologies are enabled by LLVM. And there we had uh, kind of understood the philosophy of LLVM, which enables it to be used by so many technologies, right? Uh, the vision, if you see, it was better compile time, uh, better performance of generated code, and uh, try to support. So uh, if you see uh, the fourth line, it, uh, in 2008, they were saying that if possible, support multiple languages and applications. And today it supports, uh, it is a reality, it kind of supports multiple language and languages, front ends and back ends. And yeah, it won't, uh, we always wanted to build it as a set of modular components. So if this was the vision, so what was the output then? Uh, uh, can we go to the next slide? Oh, by the way, uh, what Ashutosh clicked just now is the first uh, session uh, from 2008 developers meeting. Uh, I uh, kind of put it. If you are interested, you can go and watch it. OK, um, and I would also like to highlight that this picture that you see right now uh, and the, pre the contents of the previous slides are kind of uh, referred uh, from one of the presentations which was uh, uh, done in 2000. Uh, eight. So the uh, no, uh, we can go, we go to the previous slide only. Okay. Yeah. One second. Yeah, yeah sure. No problem. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so what you see here is there are uh, three things. I'll I'll only cover a subset of what was the output of that vision. So the three things here are. Uh, LLVM optimizer, LLVM code generator, and Clang C and C++. So what you see is that uh, there was something called as LLVM GCC 4.2. What, uh, what that means is the GCC front end was present, but the optimizer and the code generator uh, were that of LLVM. And uh, that did generate good results. And uh, Today, if you look at it, as Ashutosh has already emphasized earlier, the LLVM optimizer is used by multiple front ends, and uh, LLVM code generator, uh, the multiple backends kind of tweak it and uh, the two uh, basically suit their target specific uh, requirements. So first, the LLVM optimizer and the code generator was 
developed and after that they also developed their front end so this is the background that why understanding llvm optimizer is important in the previous session we had understood the philosophy of it in this session let us understand what does the optimizer and code generator actually do so we can go to the next slide then thanks the llvm optimizer basically um, do you all remember the three phase uh, compiler diagram you have a front end you have a middle end and you have a back end so the so the middle end uh, it it can be referred to as the llvm optimizer what it does is uh, you can see a, a diagram at the bottom left it basically takes input as the llvm ir and does some optimizations on it and produces the llvm ir which means that input and output both are same but uh, uh, if you have a if you uh, have take a difference of them they will be different because uh, you, there are some optimizations which are done now these optimizations are referred to as passes and uh, they are categorized into three types Anal analysis transformation and utility so i'm going to only cover analysis and uh, transformation in brief here uh, basically analysis what does it do it only analyzes your input uh, llvm ir so it will collect several information which are used by the transformation pass passes so transformation passes it will modify your llvm ir um, so example of analysis uh, passes a simple example is you are, you want to count the number of uh, instructions so that's inst count the transformation pass we will see example in the uh, next slide but before that there are there are multiple uh, transformation pass one of them is dead code elimination which means that whatever dead code you have you get rid of it for example uninitialized variables uh, no for example variables which are not really used throughout the program so they are kind of uh, removed uh, that could be one small instance and uh, the nature or the philosophy of the llvm optimizer is that it should be uh, reusable by all front ends and the targets uh, do you have any questions here or we can go to the next slide oh by the way uh, there was one more uh, diagram which i have put here so that is uh, which is you can see there is module 1 and uh, which uh, you optimize it and you get another the another variant of module 1 so uh, both of these diagrams are one and the same thing uh, just in case of c++ your module could be a source file so your optimizer will convert uh, one uh, source file into it will work on each module and optimize it um do we go to the next slide sure okay so uh, if you want to uh, basically see what does the llvm optimizer and analyzer do we know now that llvm uh, optimizer is uh, not only just changing the code it's also analyzing your input uh, code it's collecting information about your llvm ir so if you want to really uh, see what does it do you have a command or uh, whatever tool you could call it which is called opt and you could pass the relevant uh, options to it to um, see the output uh, the output will be your llvm ir uh, i have not really added the uh, screenshots of uh, what commands you can use here that i will uh, add it um, later on so what you see here is that uh, your input is the c++ uh, it is what it is uh, uh, just doing addition of two uh, variables x plus y um, can you use the pointer also uh, ashutosh maybe so uh, okay okay where do you to point it okay yeah, yeah yeah the first one is the c++ code can you point so yeah, uh, yeah uh, i am <laughs> kind of highlighting this just for your easy reference so this is converted into uh, if you follow the arrow down you this is converted into this llvm ir and you see it's kind of verbose uh, and then uh, at the end it is converted if you follow the arrows it is converted into the uh, into uh, a very small version of or very optimized version of the llvm ir 
So what is what is this? It's basically uh, this optimization that you see here is mem2 reg, which means that it is converting your memory references to uh, registers. What happens is that um, the compiler, or uh, rather I would say Clang, uh, allocates all the variables into stack, and then it kind of uh, uh, loads from it, reads from it, basically stores into stack and then reads from it. So you see two store, you see two alloca followed by two store, and then you are loading from the um, stack. So that's why two load. And then the finally the addition happens. And if you, uh, what, what basically this is, this is SSA format, which means that there is only uh, one def, uh, each variable has only one definition and it can have multiple uses. So in order to prune this SSA form, mem2 reg is applied and uh, basically whatever extra, uh, whatever allocas have only one load and one store, they are kind of um, removed and you get this um, optimized IR. I'll pause here for a moment. And if you have any questions we could take. Okay. You want to go next slide? Yes, we can go. So uh, we have covered the optimizer. Now this LLVM IR needs to be converted into machine code. So who is doing that? Uh, LLVM code generator. And in the three phase compiler diagram, this can be referred to as the backend. And um, I did mention that you're translating the LLVM IR to target specific code, which means that you're also doing some target specific optimizations. And they're also kind of implemented as passes or uh, some functions in those passes. Uh, there are various examples uh, of, uh, uh, there are various examples in the LLVM code generator. So first is that instruction select, selection is there, scheduling is there, register allocator is there. Um, the diagrams that you see on the left-hand side, it basically, uh, the bottom, uh, I will explain. So what you are doing is in all this transformation, you are converting from um, a more canonical form of the in, uh, of the code into a less canonical form. So less uh, canonical, which uh, means that um, a particular expression can be uh, written in multiple ways. So uh, as you go down the flow, you will re restrict your uh, code to only one possible um expression so you cannot have multiple expressions uh, out of it and uh, which also means that your uh, as you go down the flow your optimizations the probability of doing optimizations kind of reduces or rather the ease of doing optimizations reduces uh, maybe we can uh, take one example which is there on the next slide Similar to uh, optimizer, if you want to see what uh, this code generator does, the command to use is LLC. So this command will help you to see um, how is uh, what code is machine code is generated from the given input IR. Now this uh, picture that you see is uh, basically um, I have um, taken a screenshot of uh, LLVM uh, OPT pipeline and uh, whatever uh, on the right hand side you will see this red uh, highlighted and green highlighted code. So uh, that is basically uh, the phase of instruction selection as in your LLVM IR is getting converted into a machine specific IR. It's not really a machine code but it's your machine specific IR. So uh, you see something like uh, on the right on the extreme right in the green highlighted code, you see this add 32 RM. So that is x86 uh, specific um, opcode for uh, add, for 32 bit add. So th this example I wanted to cover. Uh, I will offline share 
the commands for LLC, how you could actually use LLC given an input LLVM IR. Um, one thing I can highlight here is that LLC and OPT, they are not really um, uh, widely used except for specific people. You will not see a lot of people playing around with it because uh, if you just give options to, if you just use Clang, Clang um, in inside only actually invokes LLC and OPT and you don't have to go through all this complexity. But the reason why we covered here is that LLVM uh, optimizer and code generator form a very important part of the technologies. Any uh, improvements in the LLVM optimizer can lead to improvement in all the technologies which are using it. So um, that is the reason we wanted to cover it and it gives you a complete picture of everything. Uh, machine code. Okay, so I see a question. Can we take questions, Ashutosh? One yes, question. Sure. Uh, okay, I see the last question on the screen, which is what is the difference between machine IR, uh, okay, MIR, and machine code? So machine code is uh, much more lower into the um, stack, as in if if you first is your LLVM IR, then you have MIR uh, machine. Uh, MIR, LLVM MIR, and then you have a machine code. So MIR actually allows you to do a lot of other optimizations. One of them is uh, register allocation. But after machine code, you, do, you don't have a scope for doing a lot of optimizations. And uh, that's why uh, that's the major difference, I could say. Uh, would you like to add anything, Ashutosh? Yeah, no, that's about right. OK. So you can move on. Yeah, yeah. We can move ahead. Uh, you would like to uh, cover? Yeah. My... Yeah. So uh, basically, LLVM is used uh, multiple times in the pipeline of the compilation of a program. Let's say you take a C or CPP file and then you pre process it, and then uh, the compiler converts it into an intermediate form, and then finally you have your assembly where your assembler is invoked, and then finally you have object files. The object files are linked together by a linker, and then they are finally loaded into memory by a loader, and then it is finally executed. So later on, we'll see how all of these parts play out, and we'll break down a program. So let's get started with Clang. So Clang is the major project uh, that is referred to alongside LLVM. It's one that most people are most familiar with. So it is the C or C++ front end, although it can compile other languages also, such as Objective-C, Objective-C++, OpenMP, OpenCL. So what is Clang's job? Clang's job is basically taking your source code and converting it into LLVM IR. So uh, basically LLVM always hasn't uh, had a front end. In fact, till 2006, it used GCC's front end. As we mentioned before, GCC was not really very modular. So this was a project known as uh, Dragon Egg. You can still read about it till about GCC 4.2 in the slide that Prerna showed pre previously. Uh, LLVM used the GCC front end until Apple decided to develop Clang for various reasons. One was licensing reasons and the other fact that uh, GCC and uh, LLVM were not really built to work with each other. So Clang is out of the box, made to be compatible with many of the GCC compiler flags. And uh, Clang also refers to the Clang driver. So a driver is a program that basically it's an umbrella for all of the different phases of compilation. So when we are talking about the linker, loader, assembler, optimizer, all of them can be called using the Clang driver. And we'll take a short look at this using something known as Godbolt. So uh, Godbolt is basically an online software that's free for anyone to use. You can uh, you can also use it. You have to just go to godbolt.org. And it's very useful for uh, visualizing how programs are broken down across different compilers. So let's just uh, really uh, Try it out. I'll zoom in a bit so that it's easier for you to see. On the left, on the leftmost pane, we have a bog standard uh, C program, which is all it's doing is it's printing the first and natural number. We have a for loop that 
takes a sum and increments it to print the first and natural numbers and then prints their sum. So as you execute this program, you can see on the rightmost pane, the first and natural numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and the sum is 55. This is what you get when you compile the program. However, let's say I want to stop the execution of this program and actually look at what the LLVM IR looks like. So to your compiler, you can pass options. And right over here, I add two flags, hyphen S and hyphen emit LLVM. So this, now you can see the middle pane has changed. And now I have the LLVM IR instruction. So this is one of the best ways of learning LLVM IR actually. You can just uh, write really small C or C++ programs, feed them into Godbolt and look at what LLVM IR it generates. Uh, this is a very small program, so there won't really be a difference whether you use uh, O3 or O2. Apart from maybe, yeah, you can see here that uh, when I gave O3 flag for maximum optimization, it seems to have unrolled the loop. So uh, yeah, you can use SIMIT LLVM with Clang to uh, emit the LLVM IR. Similarly, let's say you want to see the Lexer's output. So you have XClang and then dump uh, tokens. So XClang slash uh, XClang uh, calls the driver and then dump token basically dumps the tokens. So now on the rightmost pane, you can see that I can see the compiler's Lexer output. So the lexical analysis phase, as you mentioned before, you can see when there is a left parenthesis, when there is, when it detects a, a keyword, when it detects a comma, when it detects a string red literal. So why is the lexical output so long? Because we've included stdio.h in the beginning, right? So all of the output of that is what comes before the actual program at the end. So you can see here the compiler has detected that we have a left left parenthesis, then we have the string literal, the sum, then we have a comma, then we have an identifier, then we have a right parenthesis, then we have a semi, uh, a semicolon, and then we have a right brace, and then finally there's the end of the program. So similarly, let's say you want to take a look at the AST. The AST is also something that we've been talking about, right? So uh, it's the abstract syntax tree that's generated by Clang. So again, just by giving xclang and AST dump, you can actually dump the AST onto the screen. And here you can see that uh, you have your various, uh, this is how your uh, clang frontend basically perceives the syntax tree. It's saying that there's a compound statement. Inside the compound statement, there's a binary operator, which is equal to, when there's a decal ref expression, there's another binary operation. There's an implicit cast going on inside so this is your uh, abstract syntax tree. You don't need to worry too much about what all of these things mean, but uh, later on, uh, as you build your own tools, like let's say you want to build a tool that only uh, uh, takes a C, file, a C or C++ file and <coughs> changes the name of all of the functions to something else. So then you can actually pick up uh, uh, a function expression or a, a call expression and then rename just that to something else. So uh, using uh, Godbolt, uh, it's uh, very easy to uh, break down a Clang program and walk through it without having to uh, do it all yours, uh, like without having to build LLVM. Uh, in the future, we'll have a session on Godbolt. Uh, it's a part of this series, and uh, we'll cover it in more uh, detail. It's the next session. So yeah, yeah, yeah. the next Saturday we are having. Yeah. So uh, then continuing on, so there are a lot of tools that are built on top of Clang. So uh, Clang uh, provides a very useful API known as libtooling or uh, libclang for the C1 and libtooling for the C++ one. So even if you don't know anything about compilers, you can just use this API as is to write code formatting tools or linter tools or uh, uh, even uh, query tools. So for example, Clang format is uh, both a library and a standalone tool that can reformat your C++ source files according to style guides. So this is actually very useful. Let's say that uh, uh, LLVM has certain coding guidelines. Maybe they say that you should use tabs, you should not use spaces. Maybe they say, they say that your function should be named a certain way. Maybe they have certain rules regarding indentation or how you use braces. So just feeding a program into Clang format will produce a 
properly formatted uh, output file as uh, per whatever instructions you give it. So we saw the lexical uh, output just in the previous slide. So clan format uses clan's lexer to transform an input file into a token string. So uh, just like that, there is another tool called clan tidy. Uh, it's a C++ based linter tool. It provides a framework for building compiler based static analysis tools. So basically, without running your program, you can uh, get to know uh, a, a lot of uh, its behavior and a lot of uh, questionable uh, things can be fixed uh, without having to run the program. Clan query allows you to basically build tools yourself. And uh, I used Clan query to develop a tool uh, during my Google Summer of Code project where the goal was to translate some uh, C++ code into MicroPython code. So I basically picked up equivalent expressions and transformed one into the other. It wasn't exactly the most uh, efficient way to do it, and it wasn't always 100% correct, but uh, it did work. So we have an upcoming session. I think it's the sixth or seventh session that will uh, cover plan tools in a, a lot more detail. So. Then let's come to the uh, second of our sub projects. Uh, it's a very interesting sub project, which is the LLD linker. Now, uh, linkers are something that are taken for granted. You have several C files, you compile them together, and you link them together, and you go on with your day. But when projects get really large, and by really large, I mean the size of, say, Google Chrome or Clang itself or Firefox, then you have thousands and potentially even millions of files. So how you link those files, whether you are able to link those files in parallel or whether you are able to link them sequentially, it makes a very big difference in the speed. So uh, there's uh, one uh, major person who's been working on linkers for the LLVM ecosystem and even outside it for a while now. His uh, name is Rui Uyama. Uh, he works at Google. So he created the LLVM LLD linker, which is around 10 times faster than the previous uh, GNU Gold linker. So earlier GCC came with the GNU Gold linker and the BFD linker, and LLD is around 10 times faster than that. And now he's developed a new linker, uh, although I don't think the new linker is based on LLVM, but uh, it's known as Mold, and that's 10 times faster than his second linker. So if uh, Let's say you take 65 seconds to compile Clang, uh, to link Clang using Gold. You will take uh, 10 seconds using LLVM LLD. So that's a pretty big saving. And similarly with Firefox, if you're taking about uh, 30 seconds using GNU Gold, you will take uh, less than 10 seconds using LLVM LLD. So how does LLD actually use LLVM? LLD reads uh, bitcode object files. It compiles them using LLVM and it emits an output file. So because of the power of LLVM IR and the power of reading bitcode files, which Prerna covered earlier, you can, it can see the entire program and it can optimize the entire program all at once. So uh, this is one of the sub projects of LLVM. Then uh, we come to one of the most exciting sub projects of LLVM, which is known as MLI. Uh, MLI stands for multi-level intermediate representation, and this is a framework to build your own compiler IR. Uh, so why would you want to do that? Uh, let's say you have a programming language like Fortran or Julia, and uh, these programming languages have certain features, and sometimes there are some optimizations that you can do at the high level itself without having to uh, lower down to LLVM IR. The a biggest a strength of LLVM IR is also one of its weakness is that it's uh, quite low level. So by the time your compiler has done all its analysis and generated the syntax tree and come to LLVM IR, it's lost a lot of the context. Like uh, once the optimizer kicks in, it rearranges your code and uh, a lot of the original uh, details and things are stripped out by optimization. So MLIR allows you to write your own compiler IR. It, you can define your own type system operations, and uh, it has a toolbox that covers all your infrastructure needs. So it provides you a lot of things like diagnostics or pass infrastructure. Pass infrastructure means like, uh, let's say LLVM goes over the code and eliminates dead code, or 
uh, it uh, rearranges code to execute more efficiently or it does strength reduction or vectorization. Uh, MLIR also provides you with multi-threading testing tools. Basically, if you are writing your own language, these are a lot of things that you would have to implement yourself anyway. And MLIR takes away that pain away from you. So it's a high level IR for general purpose languages. Uh, so we'll see Flang later. And uh, it's used in machine learning also, uh, in hardware design, in runtimes, and in research projects. So it is a new project. MLIR is relatively new. And uh, it was developed by Google and uh, uh, Professor Uday Bundugula from IASC. And uh, it's important to see that MLIR is not really a replacement for LLVM. They are a complementary technology. As I said, what do I mean here by the concept of a tool chain? Is uh, just think that the way uh, you would uh, have, a, say, a web project. In a web project, you have to make a choice for a front end language yeah. and a back end language. I'm not very familiar with it, but let's say you choose React and Node.js, and you have to choose a database, whether it's uh, like something like uh, a, 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 an uh, RDBMS or a NoSQL database. You have to make choices. So let's say you have to compile some really big application, like let's say ECMWF, it's a weather forecasting model, or say Unreal Engine, which is used for games. So for these very large software, you uh, have several dependencies. You have a lot of libraries you need. You have multiple compilers. Sometimes some of the code is written in one language and some is another. You need a linker, and finally you need to execute it. So like let's say if you're executing on an Intel processor, it might be faster to use Intel's MPL math libraries instead of using, uh, say, GNU libraries. It might be faster to use Intel's own compiler instead of uh, Clang. Or if you're ex executing on uh, AMD, uh, it might be faster to use AOCL instead of using Intel's libraries. So while you're assembling a tool chain for your large application, so MLIR can be a part of that. And there are several things. Uh, for one, one example is the, the Flang compiler itself that uses both MLIR and LLVM in the same compiler. And uh, we'll see that later. So we come to that application. So uh, of using uh, uh, MLIR and LLVM together in the same application and why it's useful. Uh, if you are looking for a compiler product project to start out on, like uh, one of the main problems that people have with breaking into compilers is that all of the EGP work is already done, right? Somebody has already uh, implemented all of the easy things. So it's very hard for a beginner to find a footing. So how do you uh, really get a project to contribute to? So LLVM Flag is an exciting project. It's a very new compiler. Actually, last year was... Uh, the first time it was able to compile a Hello World program. So there is a lot of things that are still to be implemented. So why is this important? So Fortran is basically one of the most popular HPC languages even now. So a lot of applications such as SciPy, WASP, CP2K, which is a quantum chemistry application, WRF, which is a weather forecasting application, all are written in Fortran. So currently we have a classic plan compiler which uses LLVM, but it was written in C and does not use IR builder. So basically it uses LLVM the same way Julia or Rust use LLVM. So it could not be a part of the monorepo. So NVIDIA, ARM and AMD, all these companies together, they started working on a brand new Fortran compiler sometime uh, uh, around 2018 which is written using very modern C++, uh, C++ 17. It's beautiful code. You should definitely check it out. It uses MLIR to develop a high-level IR, uh, which is known as FIR, Fortran IR. And after several uh, uh, optimizations, the L FIR dialect is converted to LLVM dialect. So LLVM dialect is then translated to LLVM IR. So it currently supports OpenMP 1.1, but support for a lot more things has to be added. So if you're looking for a, a compiler to contribute to, uh, this is a good, uh, uh, a good job. So basically, uh, the MLIR over here comes in the front end of the compiler, and it for, uh, passes certain Fortran-specific things. 
and then LLVM comes in the back end of the compiler. So this is not the only place MLIR can be used. It can be used in several other ways, but uh, this is just one example. So uh, another sub project of the LLVM uh, infrastructure is compiler RT, which contains your runtime libraries. So what are runtime libraries? Let's say you are compiling for a 32 bit target and you have some 64 bit code and uh, or you know 64 bit types. So that has to be converted down to a format that can be easily understood by the computer. So you have several runtime libraries, like let's say the C runtime libraries uh, that execute when you execute a program. So compiler RT is a set of runtime routines that uh, provide you various built-in functions. It has uh, sanitizers also. So sanitizers are something very interesting. You can use them to uh, perform runtime checks on your code. So <laughs> you can use sanitizers to get buffer overflows, memory leaks, uh, and even more sophisticated stuff like undefined behavior, UV sanitizer. So uh, sanitizer is something that we'll be covering in another talk. It's the ninth talk in our series, and uh, it's a topic that really deserves its own talk. And uh, using sanitizers is a very nice way to like uh, be able to get a lot more reliable performance out of your programs. So this is compiler IT. And uh, we also have a lot of LLVM implementations of existing software, which is libc, libc++, and libc lc. So basically, you have your C++ standard library, which was earlier known as STL. Uh, competitive programmers will definitely know what STL is. So LLVM also has a C++ implementation of the STL. It's called uh, libc++. There is a C implementation called libc. And there is an OpenCL implementation for libs, libclc. So uh, it's always nice to have options. Like uh, there might be cases where one uh, implementation of an open library is better than the others. And uh, currently, uh, there's been a lot of work done to really compile uh, the Linux kernel without using a GNU or GNU-based tool chain. So ever since the Lin uh, Linux operating system or the kernel has been created, it has traditionally always been compiled with uh, GCC and uh, glibc and GNU based tools. Although now there are Linux distros which can compile uh, G, uh, like uh, the Linux kernel without using any GNU based tool. I believe there's a project called uh, Alpine Linux that does this. So these are the open LLVM So uh, one more update talk to have is on the LLDB debugger. So it's a next-gen debugger. It's got very good performance. Uh, it leverages a large part of the LLVM project infrastructure, such as the Clang expression parser and LLVM disassembler. So uh, this is a very good example of uh, LLVM modular nature because although GVD and GCC are uh, like uh, combined, pro uh, like they are diff uh, they are related. They are both under the GNU umbrella. But still, uh, uh, you have uh, like you know almost very separate code bases for both, even though both need a large amount of the same stuff. So LLDB is the default debugger in Xcode on macOS, and it supports debugging C, C++ on uh, iOS. And uh, LLDB is written in C++, whereas GDB is written in C. Uh, LLDB also converts debug information into clan types. Uh, and it leverages Clang infrastructure. So we have a talk on LLDB versus GDB as well. And it's not like LLDB can only be used with LLVM and GDB can only be used with uh, GCC. You can use any debugger of your choice. In fact, at AMD, uh, our default uh, uh, compile, Fortran compiler uses LLVM and we use GDB to debug it. So <laughs> it depends on your use case. So. Uh, I think Prerna has a talk planned on LLDB versus GDP, so do attend that. We also have uh, parts of the OpenMP project. Uh, LLVM makes use of OpenMP. So OpenMP is basically a way to write parallel code. So let's say you have a Fibonacci program. Uh, right? On the left side, you can see the graph. I have Fibonacci program for say 35 iterations. So uh, uh, Fibonacci is a sequential program by nature, unless you design it to be parallel or unless you make use of OpenMP pragmas. So, uh, 
there's an API for C, C++, and Fortran that supports multi-platform shared memory multiprocessing on many platforms. So OpenMP makes use of pragmas. So pragmas are basically compiler hints. You can give hints to the compiler on what to do. So there are multiple OpenMP pragmas like parallel do, task shared, uh, and uh, OpenMP critical. So you can give these, uh, like you can insert these pragmas into your program and you can parallelize your program. So you can take the execution time from say here, what 1.5 seconds down to uh, like 0 0.2 seconds. And it parallelizes with the number of cores. So as the number of your cores increases, OpenMP can parallelize across that. So OpenMP impacts a large part of the LLVM project from the front end, such as Clang and Flang, through the middle end and up to the multitude of OpenMP runtimes. So uh, parallel programming is a really interesting topic. And uh, we had a talk on it by Professor Rupesh Nasre. You can go to our YouTube channel and check out that talk also, although it wasn't specifically on OpenMP, but uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, finally, down to our last one or two tools, we have Volt. And uh, Bolt is exciting because it's one of the newest projects in LLVM. Bolt was actually created by Facebook, uh, what we now call Meta. And uh, Bolt can optimize binaries, which is uh, really amazing if you think about it. So uh, traditionally, how do you optimize the program? You do instrumentation-based profiling. Like, uh, let's say you measure how many times a certain loop was taken or how many times a certain branch was taken, or which part of your code executed the most. So to do this, you have to insert counters into your code. And this naturally makes your code run a lot slower. So instrumentation-based profiling or profile-guided optimization is not always practical, especially if your program is very large and already takes hours, hours and days to build and hours and days to run. You can't really uh, optimize it the same way. So this is where Bolt comes in. Bolt uses sampling theory uh, and uh, uh, tools like uh, Linux Perf tool to uh, basically overcome these issues and it makes a best guess for what kind of memory layout you should have. So it optimizes the application's code layout based on the execution profile gathered by the profiler. And uh, this was a project that was added to LLVM in 2021. It was independently developed by uh, Meta before that. And uh, you can read the paper. It heavily leverages a lot of uh, LLVM libraries. And uh, Bolt is not real. It's not like Bolt can only optimize LLVM code. It can optimize code uh, generated by any compiler since it works on binaries. And uh, it's a really interesting project. and. I'd uh, really urge you to read the research paper that was presented at the CBO conference. It's a, it's a really cool uh, application. So, so finally, we come to some of the incubated projects. So these are projects that are not a part of the mono repo, but they aspire to become a part of the mono repo, or they have a very close relation to the LLVM project and they live under the same uh, uh, GitHub org. So we have Torch MLIR. The goal of Torch MLIR is to provide first class compiler support from PyTorch to MLIR. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, project. And we've actually had a talk on Torch MLIR uh, 101 from Prashant Kumar from Nord Labs. So uh, this is one more talk that's there in our YouTube channel. You can go see it. Uh, Polygeist, Polygeist is an attempt to create a C or C++ front end for MLIR. It also features polyhedral optimizations, parallel optimizations. So uh, basically, it's an attempt to create a Clang IR similar to the way the Fortran compiler has a Flang IR. CIRCT is something we saw in the previous talk. It stands for Circuit IR Compilers and Tools. So this is an attempt to apply LLVM and MLIR techniques into EDA tools such as uh, Vivado and Vitus. Uh, it's a very interesting project and it is also started by Chris Lattner, and a lot of industry players have begun incorporating CIRCT into the pipeline. Uh, then there's the Enzyme project, which is a tool that takes arbitrary LLVM code and computes the derivative and gradient of it. This <laughs> allows them to differentiate programs in a variety of languages. 
such as C, C++, Swift, Julia, Rust in a single tool. So I don't know a lot, whole lot about Enzyme, but uh, you can check it out uh, at enzyme.mit.edu. And finally, there is Poly, which uh, has high level loop and data locality optimizers and optimization infrastructure for LLB. So these were all of the, not all, but I think about 80 or 90% of the sub projects that live within LLB. And you can see how each of them is related to creating LLVM in some way and how each of them uses it. Some use LLVM's front end, some use client, some use the optimizer, some use uh, binary, uh, like the runtime libraries. Some still other tools use other parts of the tool chain. And that's why all of these live in the mono repo. So to conclude the presentation, uh, you can get up to date with LLVM in uh, several ways <laughs> because it's a really big project. So uh, one of the best ways is the LLVM Weekly, which is uh, Alex Bradbury's newsletter. Uh, let me just open that here and uh, show you all. So uh, it's uh, it's an independent project uh, started like a few years ago. It now has 500 editions. So every week uh, you get a post like this, which tells you what are the new things that happened around the world. Uh, what were the things that were posted on the LLVM forum? What are the main commits that were committed to LLVM and Clang and other projects? Uh, basically, uh, Alex Bradbury picks up the most uh, happening things and uh, covers them in LLVM weekly. There's also a Discord server. There's also a discourse page, which is a more formal forum. There's a YouTube page where you can attend uh, talks from the previous dev meetings, and it's one of the best ways to learn about new and exciting things happening in the LLVM space. There's also Office Hours. Uh, so Office Hours is an interesting concept where uh, some uh, specialists, you know, uh, folks with a lot of experience in one area of LLVM, they put aside some time in their calendar and you can talk to them and uh, you can have a chat with them. You can ask them about their work. You can clear doubts, anything. But also project specific meetings. So like, let's say you want to get involved in developing the LLVM plan compiler. Uh, like, uh, let's say you want to attend the meeting of the developers that uh, are building that compiler. So you can actually get calendar links. These are talks, uh, meetings that are open to everybody. Just be respectful, be nice, and uh, you can learn a lot and you can even get to implement some features on your own. So there's an open calendar. And finally, there's our own meetup page and our YouTube channel that uh, I think many of you are familiar with. Uh, for the folks who are attending the meeting the first time, I'll be uh, putting a link to our uh, WhatsApp community that we found for this series. And uh, other than that, uh, that really concludes it from my side for this talk. And uh, we'll be taking any questions. Thank you. Uh, I think there were a, there were some questions. Yeah, um, please. Uh, let's go over them one by one. Okay, I, I'm uh, pulling out from the last one, uh, like from the oldest one. Yes. There was one question about uh, God Bolt, actually. Let me pull it out. I just missed it. Um, does God Bolt also provide insights to the data structures that is used by the compiler? So insights to the data structures. Okay, so this is a good question. So what you're basically asking is uh, how, uh, like what kind of data structures LLVM itself uses? And the answer to that is not an obvious, uh, I mean, it's not, uh, I mean, I'd say that you cannot really get it from God Bolt itself. The best way to do that would be to see the source code. Like uh, LLVM has some very specific data structures that are implemented in it, like, uh, one I can say is a small vector. So small vector is a data a data structure that's used in LLVM code base. And you have to understand that a large part of LLVM code base is not really documented the same way you consider normal documentation. Yes, you do have uh, uh, doxygen and uh, you do have some documentation, but uh, most parts they usually say that just read the source code and uh, you know, figure it out for yourself. 
तो गॉड बोल्ट विल नॉट हेल्प यू विथ एनालाइजिंग एल एल वी एम जोन डेटा स्ट्रक्चर बट इट कैन हेल्प यू एनालाइज वॉट गोज ऑन इन डेटा स्ट्रक्चर इन एनी प्रोग्राम दैट यू राइट तो आई होप दैट आंसर इज द क्वेश्चन and uh, in the slides uh, some time back uh, we had shown uh, there is this option of llvm opt pipeline where you can see what happens uh, uh, how does every optimization kind of changes the ir so that's also quite helpful you could uh, refer to that and uh, yeah there was a request for a tutorial uh, uh, as well so uh, the next session is on godbolt uh, we hope you join for that and yeah. uh, do we have any questions uh, across uh, mir versus machine code so by machine code i had actually meant mc layer as in there is something called as uh, there is a class called as mc ins uh, which is uh, referring to the mc layer there is a class called as uh, machine instruction uh, machine uh, ins uh, tr which is uh, actually uh, related to mir so at mc layer also uh, like when you are kind of assembling and disassembling uh, you could actually do some uh, not optimizations you can call them but yeah the scope is very limited um, but if you have any questions please ask us uh, around mc layer i think there was uh, one more question around uh, you can also unmute and ask you know if the, if the session is done so Uh, so i know that this was really fast paced and it covered a lot but uh, this was the last of the overview sessions that we had if you really go through our plan for what session we planned right the first three were really overview sessions that covered llvm from a birds eye view but uh, now all of the talks will be related to a specific topic like uh, compiler explorer c reduce client id and client format and code coverage LLDB and GDB, finding bugs with sanitizers and some pilot flags for performance. So we'll get a lot more uh, specific and uh, we'll go a lot more in depth instead of width. So yeah, uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, there was one question which I don't see it was answered. Uh, <coughs> why does a programming language like Zig want to remove LLVM, LLD, and Clang libraries? the blame is on slow compile times is this true yeah so this is a way, this is a very nice question uh, kudos to the person who asked it because they keep up with the development of zig language so uh, for those who are not familiar zig is a, a new programming language and recently they had a github issue that was originally titled filing for divorce from llvm very interesting title Uh, so uh, basically what happens is using llvm comes with a certain overhead uh, people who work on languages that have an llvm backend know this uh, why this happens is llvm as a project it moves incredibly fast so there are tons of AP, uh, api and abi breakages there's a lot of things that change on with each version uh, like uh, for example i was writing a clang based tool and uh, when the tool uh, the tool had some blogs written around it like uh, lib tooling had some blogs so there there was a function to return the beginning of a line and it was called get begin log and when i tried using get begin log my program didn't work i found out later that they changed get begin log to to get log begin so <laughs> they changed the name of the function so a lot of little little things keep changing in llvm and it's hard to keep up especially if you are developing a language and just care about llvm as a backend you don't really necessarily want to keep up with the language and what all is going on in the trunk and also uh, yes there is a criticism of compile time for llvm because uh, it runs a whole lot of passes so maybe for something like c++ llvm is a very fast alternative but for something like zig or something like julia maybe their authors feel that they can develop a backend that is faster for their language than llvm because llvm is really a generic solution rather than a 
uh, one size fits all thing, right? So uh, some language developers do feel that uh, keeping up with LLVM or sometimes their language has a problem with LLVM IR and they have to put a, uh, push a change to LLVM in order for uh, like it to work, but LLVM developers don't accept those patches for some reason, such as uh, it being submitted too late or it not conforming with their guidelines. So uh, if you're using somebody else's tool chain, then you have to put up with them and whatever uh, standards and guidelines they have. So a lot of developers and uh, projects feel that they're better off without LLVM, uh, even though all of the advantages it comes with. So I hope uh, that answers your question. Uh, there was uh, one more question. I think we have got answers for that as well. So. Uh, he says that uh, he or she says that I am in college right now. What's the best way for me to explore LLVM compiler as a whole? So uh, and he all, uh, and the person also says that the compiler design course is not yet started. What I can do to learn it? So you would like to add anything? Uh, so add I anything to it? I think uh, there's uh, some very useful tips in the chat already. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, all I can say is that the comp uh, you can't really expect the college course to teach you that much anyway. So don't consider it a loss. Uh, you can, uh, I, I'd say that picking up at least some compiler theory would be useful. So let's say from something like the Dragon book, which is Aho Ullman City, it's the traditional book that all compiler writers read at some point, or the Apple book, or uh, say an, any other book. <laughs> One other way is uh, you can try to build a toy language. Uh, LLVM has this very nice uh, tutorial known as Kaleidoscope. Uh, like, let me just uh, pick that up really well, uh, really quick. So this is basically a toy language. It's not a fully featured language. Like it has like only one or two data types and support for very few things, but it serves as a nice uh, uh, like general intro, or you can write your own programming language and lower that to LLVM IR. One more thing way you can do is you can go through the list of issues, like uh, let's say bugs. There are a lot of bugs in uh, uh, in LLVM's uh, GitHub. Uh, so I think there's something like what 18,000 issues or something that are open. Yeah, so there yeah, are 20,000 issues. So some of these issues are. Uh, uh, labeled as good first issues. So you can take up some bugs and solve them. That's a good way. You can contribute to a beginner compiler. But what I'd say is start using LLVM and uh, Clang as a tool. Like uh, really, we showed a little bit of Compiler Explorer today. We'll show more of it. But uh, try to build LLVM yourself if you have the hardware. And uh, if you don't, you can use Compiler Explorer to break down small programs, explore them, and uh, basically build your own stuff. It's like uh, how it goes for any other field, right? You have to build something with LLVM to uh, really get a hold of it. Yeah, I also agree that. And I would like to add that uh, you could uh, register for any courses. So ACM has summer schools. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they're holding it now but yeah ACM as compiler summer school you can go for that and uh, yeah Shutosh is actually uh, showing some other schools uh, other courses which yeah. you could go for yeah so Cornell has a very good uh, compiler course uh, for basic compilers and advanced compilers so these are recorded lectures you could go through them and the good part about this lecture series is it actually uses LLVM so which makes it a lot easier to follow uh, rather than you know any course which uh, does not use LLVM and uses some other language instead. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I yeah, think I ahead. wanted to highlight one point here. Uh, we are over time but yeah just one point uh, that uh, you can actually uh, start with whatever things we are covering that should also be a good reference for you and uh, something like Clang format, Clang Ted, you can actually implement it in your projects and uh, see how it uh, helps you. Any C++ code, suppose you write, you could use Clang Ted or Clang format and uh, get a hold of the compiler tools. Similarly, LLDB you could use. Yeah. 